The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, July 3rd, 2016. Hello everyone and welcome to a pre-recorded eBible Fellowship's questions and answers time. This program is designed to interact with you with your questions and comments related to the Bible and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker for this pre-recorded questions and answers time, and say hello to Chris McCann. Good afternoon, and welcome, everyone, to eBible Fellowship Sunday Afternoon Question and Answer Program. During this time, we're going to take a look at the Bible with any questions or comments that anyone may have. And each person is invited to share What's ever on your mind by contacting us in one of the ways we just mentioned. And we'll be glad to take your call. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible, which is God's holy word. It is his word, the Bible, that we find truth and we find answers to our spiritual questions according to the grace that God has granted us uh, concerning whether or not he would open up understanding to us concerning the thing we're interested in. But the good thing, the encouragement for us at this time, is that God is opening up his word. He's opening up his word to the understanding of his people like never before in history. And and the Bible tells us this. The Bible tells us that God sealed up his word till the time of the end, And then at the time of the end, he is revealing information to his people. The Bible tells us this began in the Great Tribulation period, but it also indicates that it will continue throughout the prolonged period of judgment. The flood of Noah's day, we learn that God commanded Noah to store food on the ark. Just as God, in the days of Joseph, gave Joseph wisdom to store grain in storehouses against the famine. And that teaches us, again, of God's plan to store up his word against the time of the Great Tribulation. Well, also, with the flood, the Lord commanded Noah to take of all kinds of food and to store it on the ark so that they would have food to eat for them and for the animals throughout the one-year flood experience. And and they couldn't uh, harvest crops at that time. They they couldn't go outside the ark and, and do anything else. So they had to store it up. And food was stored up that fed them, that kept them nourished, throughout the entire year, from the beginning of the flood on the 17th day of the second month until the day they stepped off the ark, one year later. So that is a big picture, a spiritual picture, that shows us that it is God's intention for the people of God to be fed throughout the prolonged judgment, just as Noah and his family we're fed and we're feeding the animals. God's people are spiritually fed and also we're commanded to feed the sheep. And, and, and just as Noah and all eight souls on the ark, uh, once the door of the ark shut, they were occupied and busy every single day with feeding sheep and bears and tigers and donkeys, but they were busy feeding the remnant of animals. Since the vast majority of animals perished in the flood, they had the task of feeding the remnant of animals that God spared and delivered by bringing them onto the ark. And so those animals typify God's elect. And it's really amazing how um, perfectly the command of the Lord Jesus Christ after the great catch of fish in John 21 ties in with 
what took place on the ark from that 17th day of the second month of Noah's 600th year and every day thereafter. Feed the sheep. Feed the sheep. They weren't uh, outside trying to bring animals onto the ark. No, that part of the work was accomplished. They had the sole task of taking care and feeding the animals. God is, uh, you know, I'm surprised that we didn't notice this before, but but we didn't, and that's because God's, well, I'm, I'm not surprised on, on the other hand, God's in control of what we can see, when we can see it. And, and so now it's obvious that Noah and the other seven were busy feeding sheep. That's all they were busy doing, which again ties in with Christ's command to Peter, feed my sheep three times, indicating the purpose of God. So we have to, all of us, at E Bible, have to renew our efforts at feeding sheep. We are um, to be involved throughout the entire period, however long it may be, throughout the entire period of prolonged judgment with feeding God's sheep. And and the um, language of the flood, the language we find in Genesis 6, and, and the obvious um, task that no one his family would have had. You, you can't go a year with animals on board and not be um, ever about feeding them. They, they had to feed them at least once a day, probably more than that. And, and that is our task today. Well, again, welcome to our program. And at this time, we're going to open it up to take your calls. And we'll go to the first person on the phone today. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, good afternoon, brother. Uh, first, I want to thank God for another outstanding lesson today. Um, exactly what you say about the glory of God, giving God the glory. And it's not no um, 99.999% of God and a, a, a smidgen of us it's all of God and nothing at all and that's how I um, enjoy getting uh, understanding that it's all of God and not nothing of me and when you said when we read um, 1 Corinthians uh, 131 to give God the glory I, and I don't mean just my lip service like you were saying when I say give God the glory I, I, I refer to John 15:5. But God always said, for without me, you can do nothing. And we clearly understand that and, and relish in the fact that without God, we can do nothing. That's when you are giving God glory, because now you're saying, I have decreased and God has increased. So that's what I want to say with that. I mean, there was so much with this lesson. Today, I could really go on a long time, but I'm not going to do it for so much. Um, where Daniel said... Um, 2.30, um, but as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have. Um, Joseph said, Genesis 41.16, it is not in me. Um, Paul said, I know nothing of myself. Well, that's a true fact for the true believer. But I think um, if we look at, if we look at um, two areas of the Bible, Proverbs 27.2 speaks about I think someone given uh, uh, spoken to himself, and also we're going to look at Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse twelve and verse eighteen. Okay, Proverbs twenty-seven two. Right. right. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. And you want and to compare that good. with Second Corinthians ten, verse twelve. For we dare not make ourselves of the number. Or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Um, and verse 17 says, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. I believe that's adding on to how we should um, present ourselves and not to 
glory in ourselves as, as um, you know, take credit what we've done, what we've gotten. Because, like uh, First Corinthians four says, what have we that we have not received from God? And nothing comes from um, nothing good comes from ourselves. It all comes from God. So I was wondering, would these verses yeah, also yeah. add on to what we were studying this morning? Yeah, uh, these um, of course are true statements. And it's what man um, likes to do, prefers to do, is to compare himself to other people. Um, for instance, when, when you read the papers or you hear news accounts of terrible tragedies and, and terrorism and murders, horrible crimes, horrible deeds that are done by people, and and you hear people just speak evilly and and really look down on those people and uh man has a tendency to say well i'm not a murderer i'm not a terrorist um i'm i'm not somebody who would do uh, that ugly thing that that person just did and and there's a comparison made and really they're implying I'm a better person. I'm um, a wiser or, or, or just a more moral. Yet that is never the place that comparison should be made. You know, there's a, a law that God has given. It's the Bible. And it sets the standard. It is the perfect standard of God. And man is to uphold the whole law. We're to keep the whole law. And we are judged, we're evaluated, not based on how well I do compared to my neighbor and, and how well uh, the neighbor does compared to someone across town or another country, but we are judged based on how well am I doing compared to the law of God. And the Bible tells us none of us are doing very well. We're, we're not doing good at all. When we use the proper standard that the, the Bible is also likened to a mirror, we're to look into the perfect law of liberty to get an accurate reflection of who we truly are. When we look at other men, and you can always find someone doing something desperately wicked and and when you look at someone else well then you you feel a little bit better about yourself but when you look at that perfect holy standard that mirror that is the bible that reflects our soul what do we see sin and transgression and iniquity and and the bible is uh, just relentless in its honesty in reflecting back to the one who reads it you are a sinner you're not just a minor sinner you're chief of sinners the, the this is why people flee from the bible they they can't stand to look at themselves as they truly are, as the Bible presents that accurate reflection of what's inside them. So they get away from it. They, they flee for the darkness. They want comparisons to other wicked men. Then they can feel a little good about themselves. But the Bible relentlessly, everywhere you turn, here is God's perfect law and, and God um, tells us that we're guilty concerning our thoughts, concerning our deeds, concerning our words. And we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none good, no, not one. Oh, well, it's not just those wicked terrorists, but it is me, myself, it is everyone who looks into the Bible. We are equally as wicked and equally as bad. And this, again, for the child of God, 
well, they, they can't turn from it because God is holding them fast. He's drawing them. He will not let them go. And, and so he forces the people that he has saved to keep looking, to stay in the Bible, to stay in the Scriptures. And they see themselves, and for a time, it, it can be very grievous. Uh, they, they can be constantly um, sorrowed as they read the Bible because all they see is um, their nature and, and how uh, desperately wicked they are and all the evil that's flowing forth from their heart. Yet for God's people that he brings to the Bible, the end of the law is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, by God's grace, they realize that all of that awful filthiness that they are in, in their person, because they're a rebel and a sinner against God, all that desperate, deceitful wickedness that lies within has been forgiven. It has been cast upon Christ, laid upon him, and God poured out his wrath upon Jesus for all of our mountain of sins, cleansing us, giving us a new heart and a new spirit, and the wonderful salvation that the Bible talks about. And and so we are um, just delivered. We, we are not afraid any longer nor troubled by all of our sin in that way any anymore. It it no longer is that heavy burden. And and see that that's what the the Word of God, the Bible, was designed to do. First show us our sin, show us our tremendous need of a Savior, and and really lead someone to beseech God and cry out for mercy, to have mercy upon them for all the the wickedness they see reflected back in that perfect mirror that is the Word of God. And so that's the purpose of the Bible, is to show us what we are like. But again, when people get away from the Bible, as the unsaved have done in the world and in the church, they get away from the Bible, then their whole focus and and what they're looking at the things they're comparing to it, it's far and removed from uh, the truth of the scriptures and and so they they can think they're basically a good person probably everyone in the world thinks they're basically a good person someone just um, did something so horrible you can't repeat it well I'm basically a good person it, it it's man's natural ability to deceive himself about what he really is. And the Bible doesn't let us get away with that. It, it won't allow us to do that. And that's why people get away from the Bible. But thank you uh, for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Chris. That's the verse that I was going to pick that goes according to what you were saying today. 2 Corinthians 10.18 For not he that commends himself is approved, but who the Lord commends. So it's not those who put themselves into the kingdom of God by reaching out and grabbing salvation for themselves with their free will doctrines. Because they were just so wonderful, they even made the right choice to accept the Lord. They commended themselves so their ego could take the credit. And according to this verse, they're not approved at all. But it's who the Lord commends, who the Lord elected according to the good pleasure of his will. And whoever God's elect are will not have a problem with that at all. And I'll take your comment, Chris, as you feed the sheep. Well, yeah, you're, you're going to the same verse, and let me read it again. I'll read verse 17 again, too. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. 
And ultimately, this relates to salvation. You know, when uh, we're, we, we're living in a time, and uh, actually it's been going on throughout history, but especially today, when hundreds of millions of people say they are a child of God, they're a Christian, they are saved, and, well, how did they come to believe that? How did they come to that conclusion? And if you ask them, They'll tell you what they did. They'll say, well, I accepted Christ, or I was baptized when I was a baby, or I, the pastor said you had to walk down the aisle, or, or whatever it is, a believer's baptism. They, they, will, um, they will let you know, this is what I did that has saved me or brought about commendation from God. And yet, when man um, is involved, when it's his works that have brought salvation to him, he thinks, then he has commended himself. He's boasting or glorying in a false gift. And Proverbs tells us that, that one that glories in a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. You can have the appearance, well, the it, clouds are getting pretty dark and the wind's kicking up. We're going to have a storm. We're going to get a lot of rain. And yet, no rain comes. And, and that's just like someone that says, I am a Christian, with their mouth. They profess it. They go to the place they think is where people who are Christian should go to church, and they, that would have been correct for 1,955 years, but it's incorrect today. And they do the things they think that people who say they're Christians should do. They, they read from the Bible, they pray, uh, they sing hymns, and, and so they're giving an appearance. They're giving an appearance of being something or of someone who has received the gift and yet they're boasting, glorying in a false gift because you cannot take the gift of God to yourself. The gift of God is given. That's why it's a gift. And again, as mentioned in the study, they, they try to take a step back and say, well, yes, that's true. Uh, it, it, salvation is a gift, but you must receive the gift, don't you see? You have to take it if someone comes up and wraps a nice present for you for your birthday. Don't you put out your hands to, to receive it and to take that gift to yourself? That's what God would have us to do. You, uh, our part is to receive it. And we receive it through believing. And again, they are conniving. They're, they're uh, being deceitful workers, trying to work a little bit of work into the perfect gospel of grace. And, and God, of course, uh, will not permit that and prevents that kind of idea in John 3, 27, when he says, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. The, the same word receive that is in John 1 that they would point to, you, you see you have to receive salvation, is used here in John 3.27. And the Lord is telling us that even the receiving of a gift is part of the gift. It's all by the grace of God. There, there is no room there, as a previous caller mentioned, there, there is no room for a gospel of 99.9999% of grace and the, the littlest bit of works. That is abhorrent to God. He's a jealous God, and he gets all the glory. He commends certain ones, his elect, and those that are commended are commended, and God does the commending. 
we we cannot commend ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we we can't go and enter into heaven because of our personal commendation of uh, of ourself. I did this, and some people try that. Lord, Lord, did we not do many things in your name, and 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 cast out devils and so forth? And Jesus will say, "Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity." I never knew you. The work of iniquity was their efforts in in thinking they could do the slightest thing to gain entry to heaven. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Thank you. Good afternoon. Last Friday evening, a gentleman called looking for some better understanding of Daniel 11, verse 33, what it means for those of understanding to fall by the sword. I think we can find some good explanation of this from Ezekiel 39, verses 23, actually to the end of the chapter. Well, let me read the verse that you're referring to first in Daniel 11, 33, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil, days, many as italicize. And then in Ezekiel 39, verse 23, and the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. Therefore I hid my face from them. And gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword. According to their uncleanness. And according to their transgressions have I done unto them. And hid my face from them. Therefore thus saith the Lord Jehovah. Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob. And have mercy upon the whole house of Israel. And will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people, and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am Jehovah their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them any more there, neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord Jehovah. Uh, what, was there a comment you wanted to make about that, that well, again, passage? I'm trying to tie together what it means of people of understanding to fall by the sword. And to me, from Ezekiel, it means that those elect or believers who were in the church at the time they shouldn't have been they were told to get out or they were let out into captivity and that's when God saves them so falling by the sword means that they were given into the hands of the enemy in other words sent out into Babylon until he could collect them all well yeah yeah I think you're you're correct um, that's what's going on it uh, the context in Daniel 11 is the great tribulation when the abomination is set up and, and the uh, daily, the Holy Spirit comes out of the churches and congregations. And it's at that time that they that understood the, the wise instructed many, primarily over the electronic medium, primarily through family radio at that time, when the gospel went forth into the world. And yet, it was also a time of falling by the sword, flame, captivity, and spoil. And notice four things are mentioned there, indicating the the universal judgment on the church. And um, also, uh, to go along with the sword, in Luke 21, it says in verse 20, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. 
verse 22 and 23 also relates to the Great Tribulation, the, the time when the church is encompassed by Satan, and God finally gives the command to his people to depart out. Then it says in uh, verse 24 of Luke 21, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And in Jerusalem, there is the church. So we we have um, confirmation that to fall by the edge of the sword and to be led away captive into the nations is when the church age came to an end, when, when God commanded his people to come out. And and by the way, the, the uh, language here about the sword, we know the sword in the Bible points to the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. And here, in Luke 21, 24, the word edge, uh, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, is 4750 in the Greek concordance, and it's translated as mouth, the mouth of the sword. And, and of course, that doesn't make any sense, um, if you're looking at a literal sword. Uh, and so they translate it as edge. But it does make sense when you understand the sword is a figure of the word of God. Then we can understand this to read, they shall fall by the mouth of the word of God and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. And, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the Lord's people never saw a literal army compassing a literal Jerusalem. But through the word of God, we saw these things with uh, spiritual eyes happening to the churches and congregations. And so it was the mouth of the word of God that caused us to fall. And, and I think you're correct to... Go out into the hands of the enemy. It, it's as though they conquered Judah, and and God said uh, historically to the Jews, go to Babylon. And yet spiritually, it, it all related to leaving the church and going out into the world. So, yes, uh, thank you for that passage and your comments. Uh, they're they're helpful. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Genesis six fourteen, Isaiah twenty six twenty and twenty one, and John fourteen two. Please. Genesis six fourteen says, "Make thee an ark of gopher wood." Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within, and without with pitch. And then, um, what, what was the other verse? Isaiah 26? 26, 20, and 21. Okay. And John 22. Isaiah 26, 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed, for behold, Jehovah cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. And I'm sorry, what was the last verse? John 14, 2. John 14, 2. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I was wondering if there is any way that the rooms or nests on Genesis 6.14 will be the same chambers uh, for our days in Isaiah 26 and the same mansions in um, uh, 14, uh, John 14.2. Could you help me with that? Well, they, they, they do tie together because God's house uh, where... There are many abodes or rooms. Um, it, it has to do with 
the bringing in of the elect, and the Bible tells us we are that house. And we're also living stones that build up the house. And, and, and so to enter into the house does point to salvation. In um, Genesis 6.14, um, when the Lord is giving Noah instructions for building the ark, he uses the word room, shalt thou make in the ark, and the room it is actually a word that should be translated as nest, like a bird's nest. It, it's um, uh, most often translated that way. And it, you wonder, there is a word for rooms, and, and God could have used it. Why, why use a word for nests? And the reason is that um, the Bible pictures that which is above, that which is, which is up high or exalted, uh, in a sense, uh, as pointing to heaven as an example of um, someone who has lifted himself up. Uh, in Obadiah, we read, um, into the heavens, and God uses that analogy of um, a bird's nest. Let, let me turn there. Obadiah, the little book right before Jonah, it says in verse 3, The pride of thine heart hath deceive thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? And again, the, the habitation of the rocks, high up uh, in the mountains, points to someone who in their pride is saying, I'm saved. They've lifted themselves up as high as you can go on the earth is really what it's a picture of. And then it says in verse 4, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest, that's the same word, room, thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith Jehovah. Now in this case, it's speaking of um, an unsaved person professing to be saved, and in their profession, they have, in a sense, lifted themselves up to the heavens. And yet, because they're not truly saved, God will bring them down. But the, the figure of setting your nest among the stars points to someone who, uh, who has gained entry into heaven. And, and that's why this word rooms identifies with salvation, with being exalted up to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And, and also the, the pitch within and without identifies with the atonement that Christ performed. So the ark, everything about the ark, um, relates to God's salvation and entry into the ark, into a room of the ark would tie in and relate to the salvation of God. And so does Isaiah 26. In Isaiah 26, when the Lord says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. That, again, is language of salvation. And hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. Colossians 3, verse 3, tells us that we are dead, and our life is hid um, in Christ with God, or something similar to that. And, and it, we're, we're dead in Christ uh, through salvation. We have died with him, and, and we're hid with him. Our life is hid with him because we have become saved. And that's the hiding that God is speaking of in Isaiah, and it's what the ark is picturing. All who entered into the ark were delivered from the flood, but really the ark, this big vessel, was a, a huge historical parable pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, yes, all these verses do relate and tie together. But thank you for calling and sharing, and let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome 
to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. I'd like to look at Mark 13, verse 23. Mark 13, 23 says, But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Yes. Do you suppose that Jesus Christ completely interpreted the end times prior to May 21st, 2011, according to this verse? Do I'm sorry, do I think that Christ knew all about it? No. Um, no, no I, I, he gave it all the information before May 21st, 2011, like th this is sort of saying, like, I have told you everything in, in advance, meaning before May 21st, 2011. Do you think that he gave us the complete interpretation of the end prior to that date? Oh, okay. Well, what he did was give us the complete revelation the Bible is the, the revelation, and it's there that we are foretold all things. It says in John 16, in John 16, verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So when Jesus said, I have much more to say, but you cannot bear it now, really, uh, that's the word of God speaking, telling us that uh, you now have the Bible, and there will be more communication coming from God. There will be more for God to say to us, to reveal to us, in, in one sense, yet uh, we'll not get any more uh, divine revelation once the Bible is completed, but it will be the work of the Holy Spirit to open up the things of God, the Scriptures, in the proper time and season, the time of the end, and then you will come to a greater understanding. You'll, you'll begin to learn as the Holy Spirit guides you into all truth, into the many um, uh, truths that were uh, sealed up and hid to the time of the end. Now, I think your question is, were all the uh, teachings of the Bible open and, and revealed before May 21, 2011? And the answer is no. No, we're, uh, we, we can be certain of that and sure of that because since May 21, 2011, we've learned things that uh, we did not know before. And we've basically learned them because of our vantage point of living on the earth after the tribulation. So l let me just give a few examples. Number one. We've learned that uh, judgment is a spiritual judgment similar to the judgment on the churches. There was a spiritual judgment. We didn't fully understand that. Secondly, we've learned that uh, there will be a time period after the tribulation, days after, that is a prolonged period of time. And we've already gone five years, so it's it's... It's several years in duration. We didn't know that before. And we've learned that it's been God's plan all along to leave his elect on the earth to go through the judgment just as it was his plan to leave them on the earth to go through the great tribulation. And theologians had long speculated that, that God would rapture his people before the tribulation. Well, we learned that's that during the tribulation, that wasn't the case. And everyone, I don't know uh, of, of any theologian or, or any believer 
um, that knew this before May 21, 2011, we all thought God would certainly rapture his people before uh, the, the judgment began, or, or he would, we, we did not think he would bring his people through the judgment. Uh, even prior to May 21, what were we thinking? On May 21, the elect will be taken up, raptured. Yet the world would continue for a prolonged period of five months. We had the prolonged period of judgment correct, and the wicked experiencing it correct. The length was incorrect. But we also were incorrect that the people of God would be alive and remain on the earth also during that time. And it's amazing that we missed it. Of course, uh, it's, it's all due to the fact that we can't understand a thing unless God opens our eyes. But it's amazing when God has so plainly stated it. For instance, in 2 Corinthians 5, in, in a chapter where the, the plural pronoun is uh, used repeatedly, let me, let me give an example here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So we know and uh, that if the, our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. The, the, um, pr the plural pronoun we is used of the elect. It, it's applied to the elect there. It can't be applied to the unsaved. They, the unsaved do not have a building of God. They do not know if their earthly house is dissolved. So it can only be applied to the elect. In verse 2, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Again, plural pronouns we, are only can be applied to God's elect. Verse 3, again, only applied to God's elect. Look at um, and, and the following verses too. I'm only skipping for time. But every single reference, without exception, it is applied, the, pl the uh, plural pronoun can only be applied to God's elect. Verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Who walks by faith? Does the world walk by faith? No, only God's elect. We are confident, I say, and willing to be, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Is the world confident of that? Are unsafe people confident of that? No, only God's elect. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Again, are the unsaved laboring to be accepted of God? Of course not. Only God's elect. Then verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every single reference, every Every instance, every usage of the plural pronoun we, up until this verse, has been God's elect. And there's no change in verse 10. We must all appear. And the word appear is the giveaway. Besides the plural pronoun that can only apply to God's elect, there is no way that the word appear, which is the, the Greek word 5319, it's the word used as make manifest. It's that word that we learn in reference to Christ, that when he entered into the world to make manifest the things he had done from the foundation of the world, that it meant that Jesus was not bearing sin that he, or paying for sin. He, he was just demonstrating. That's the word. And, and that's why that word cannot be applied to the unsaved. Because the unsaved, when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, when they go through the wrath of God, it's not a demonstration. They have never previously had their sins paid for. 
it can only be a reference to God's elect. We must all appear or be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. And also, we missed, based upon this word appear, that it cannot be referring to what happened at the foundation of the world when the elect were in Christ, because it's a manifestation. And Jesus showed us, when you make something manifest, and, and, and light is what makes manifest, when you, when you make something evident, and you demonstrate something, you have to do it. You, there, there must be a performing of it in time and in history. And, and so, too, when God's elect must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, it must be in time, in history. And it must be something, a demonstration that shows forth what they have already done in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it cannot be the first time that they are appearing. It is a reference to the second time. And, and when we put it all together, God is plainly telling us there will be a time when the people of God must appear or be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. And the, the only time that could possibly be is judgment day at the end of the world. And that's right where we are at this time. It's, it's what is happening as we are still remaining, still alive on the earth and going through this prolonged judgment. And, and so God's people are um, showing forth, and the only way to finally show it completely is to endure to the end, that we bear no sin, because if we bore sin, we would be destroyed. But since we have no sin, and we have no sin, uh, due to the fact that, that our sins were paid for and we were in Christ at the foundation of the world. But thank you for calling and sharing. Let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yeah, Chris. Um, very good study this morning. I was just thinking on that subject about how we uh, can get kind of self-centered and into ourselves or comparing ourselves one with another when all the time, if we're true believers, it's Christ. He's the one that made us. And uh, everything goes to him. In Ezekiel 36, it says that uh, after we've been given a spirit, uh, a new spirit and a new heart, we will loathe ourselves. So, uh, yeah, we will see ourselves as sinners saved by Christ's faithfulness. And uh, we won't be so much riling on others or concerned about whether or not we're better than others or comparing ourselves. And in Luke 6, it says, love your enemies and pray for them that persecute you or, or whatever. Uh, no, if we see that we've been saved by Christ, then, uh, then we really rejoice, don't we? So it was a really good study. And in uh, Colossians, let's see, Hebrews chapter 10, it says, we believe to the saving of our soul. So there's a true belief and there's a false belief, right, uh, or faith. And it's really the faith of Christ that saves us, and then we have faith back. Um, all that. But anyway, it was just really good. In Colossians, could you go to Colossians 2, uh, verses uh, 11, please? Colossians 2, verse 11 says, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh 
by the circumcision of Christ. Well, that, that's kind of simply plain that it's the circumcision or the saving was done by Christ in the heart or in the spirit, and that's obviously something that free will people can't do or any of us. We can't believe to the saving of the soul in of our flesh or ourselves. That's an operation that's done by God, and also the resurrection of our soul right there is showing us that's uh, also done by God himself. And so a true believer will rest and then rejoice and be happy until we're out of this uh, place, uh, looking forward to seeing Christ in heaven, and he gets all the glory for uh, the punishment of our sins, whatever death he suffered for us or sin, uh, the, the replacement of the substitute uh, substitution for in our place. So. It's all for his glory, Psalm 132. It, it, he can have a family for himself, Mount Zion. But anyway, that subject you were on this morning uh, was really good. Just keep looking to Christ and glorify him. Thanks, Chris, for his studies. Well, thank you for calling and, and sharing your comments. Let me read the verse you referred to in Ezekiel 36, where God speaks of uh, putting a new heart and a new spirit within you and taking away your stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And then uh, in the same context, it says in verse 31, Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord Jehovah, be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. And and, and it goes on. Now, <laughs> you know, sometimes I wonder if if we could take some of these Bible verses and, and show them to um, the psychologists and psychiatrists of the world. Oh, what, uh, you know, they, they would um, definitely... Uh, be opposed to the whole idea that the Bible presents. The, the teaching of God is loathe yourself, be ashamed. And what's the teaching of the world? Accept yourself. Come uh, to, to uh, just realize you're not perfect. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the world wants to uh, smooth over all of our evil deeds and our evil thoughts and and the things that we've said and and all of our sin. Oh, well, you got to accept yourself. You you just you, you know uh, when when the Bible teaches us that we're dirty, rotten, no good, filthy sinners, and, and of course the Bible expresses that. And and a child of God comes to be of that mindset, and if it if he were uh, to make a statement along those lines, maybe not as strong as that, but make a statement along those lines, well, the world's uh, ready at hand to argue and and say uh, you're you you have low self-esteem, you, uh, and yet the truth is that it's all um, uh, their their entire psychology and. And their whole philosophy uh, to accept yourself and 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 to lift yourself up in pride and and say good encouraging positive things to yourself and and don't don't look loathe yourself oh far be it. It, it it's all contrary to the word of God we we have to keep in mind that the Bible tells us the truth the Bible tells us exactly who we are when we look into its reflection it it doesn't lie to us like the world lies to us like people lie to us it tells us the absolute truth and the truth will never harm us it will never injure us it, you know i uh, was a person who lived in the world and and accepted a lot of the world's ideas and philosophies for many years before I became a believer. And believe me, those ideas and philosophies are harmful. And it wasn't until, and, and I tended to have low self-esteem, it wasn't until 
that I learn the truth about all people. That it's not just me that's a sinner, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. The Bible's the great equalizer. It doesn't bring the child of God to a lower level than the rest of mankind. No, we know what's in man. We know that man is not uh, better than us. We, we understand that each human being is a fallen creature and, and we're all in sin. There, there's none better than another. And the Bible is the perfect psychological book. It's the perfect remedy for all of our ailments of uh, whatever we have. If, if we have any trouble in our minds, uh, the proper thinking is to align our thoughts with the thoughts of God. And, and, and so I appreciate you bringing up that verse. And also the verses in Colossians. Again, yes, God has to do the circumcision without hands because it's a it's a figurative uh, phrase pointing to circumcision of the heart, as we're told in Deuteronomy. Physical circumcision is only a type of what God had in mind, the spiritual circumcision of the heart, that is the removal of a, the old heart of stone and the giving of the new heart of flesh. Okay, let's go to the next person. Welcome to our Sunday question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Mr. McCann, I was looking at a favorite Bible story, <clears throat> probably for everybody. It's the one where Jesus walks on the water. It's in Matthew 14, Mark 6, and John 6. And I was wondering if um, that uh, could reflect the current time period. They've just fed the 5,000 Jesus goes and leaves the disciples alone. He goes to pray, and he puts them in a, a ship that will be with waves contrary. And he says it's the uh, evening, the fourth watch of the night, when he comes. And um, I was wondering, you know, we know ship is the, 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 it can be the church, but it's nighttime, and uh, the disciples are alone. I'm wondering, would we have any basis for thinking that might be our time after May 21? Well, um, yeah, typically a ship in the Bible represents the, sh represents the corporate church. And um, there, there's exceptions in John 21, but I think the word is different um, when, when they come in a little ship at, when, after the great catch of fish. Um, and and there's, there are ships, though, actually, in um, the book of Acts in Acts 28, that um, have the sign of Castor and, and Pollux. Um, in Acts 28, verse 11, and Acts 28 is after the shipwreck in the previous chapter, which, which pictured the end of the church age, and then they were um, stranded on the island of Malta for a time until this ship showed up. And then the ship um, took them to Rome, and Rome would be the world. It says in Acts twenty eight eleven. after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And, and so there, that ship identifies with the world. So it is possible to have a ship that is not a figure of the church. Now, we, we do have a ship, um, Noah's Ark, that identifies with Judgment Day, as we know that the historical account of the flood was a picture of the final judgment, and, and God shut the door of a ship, and, and all uh, on board the ship were a picture of those that are truly saved as the flood waters rose. Uh, so uh, it, it's possible. I'm not sure what Jesus uh, walking on the water um, in in leaving the ship is picturing in Matthew 14 or in those other parallel accounts. But um, it 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 could be possible to relate to uh, something other than the church. 
my reason for asking is that in Matthew and and uh, Mark, the 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 story seems to be fairly consistent. Other than in in Mark, the disciple he adds an interesting verse that the disciples' hearts had been hardened over the five thousand uh, that were fed. They didn't realize that miracle. But in Lazarus' account in verse uh, in chapter six of John, he is more specific about a timeline. He said when the it was about twenty five or 30 furlongs and i thought well god knows how many furlongs it is why does he have one or the other in there and then it it says something the other two didn't say at all that once jesus is accepted into the ship it's immediately at shore i wondered if those things meant something in our timeline perhaps well i don't know i'm not sure um how to understand uh, Christ's entry into the ship or the walking on water as far as relating it to um, the the timeline. I, I'm sorry, I don't think I can help you with that. Thank you. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday Question and Answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, uh, I was just wondering about um, spiritual reigning in Second Chronicles 21 from verses uh, 17 to 19. Second Chronicles 21, verse 17. Um, let me start in verse 16. Moreover, Jehovah stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and of the Arabians, and were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into Judah and break into it, and carried away all the substance it was found in the king's house, and his sons also, and his wives, so that there was never a son left him, save Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons. And after all this, Jehovah smote him in his bowels with an incurable disease. And it came to pass that in process of time, after the end of two years, his bowels fell out by reason of his sickness, so he died of sore diseases, and his people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years and departed without being desired, albeit they buried him in the city of David, but not in the sepulchres of the kings. Yeah, I just wanted to know, like, the spiritual meaning, if there's any, like, from verses, uh, uh, like, 18 and 19 particularly. Well, yeah, um, the... The Lord smote him, and whenever we read of God smiting um, a king of Israel or a king of Judah, it's because they were unfaithful, and the kings were pictures uh, oftentimes of um, the leaders of the corporate church. And and so um, an unfaithful king meant an unfaithful Israel or an unfaithful Judah, which would point to an unfaithful corporate church. And so God uh, smote him with an incurable disease that was in his bowels, and we don't have to know all the details of that, but we do know that when Jesus healed, and, and he healed people with diseases, and God tells us in, um, I think it's Psalm 103, he says in Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless Jehovah, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. There the Lord is drawing a comparison. He's equating forgiving all iniquities to healing all diseases. And that's why when Jesus would heal individuals with disease, it was always a picture of salvation. That means that when God is striking someone, and especially a king, with an incurable disease, that that means there will be no salvation. It, it's uh, going in, in the other direction. Instead of God working to grant grace and mercy, 
he's actively working to uh, make sure this person is under his wrath and, and experiences condemnation. There is no forgiveness of sins, in other words, and, and no mercy. There, there's no salvation in view concerning this, and uh, it, it may be why it goes on to say in verse 19, it came to pass that in process of time, and uh, let, me, let me check this. No sense not checking it when I have an interlinear right here. Uh, in the book of Genesis, that same phrase, the King James translators translated, process of time, um, yet in the Hebrew, it was actually in the end of days. So in Second Chronicles 21, verse 19... Let's take a look. Well, no, it, it I don't think it is the same same phrase that was in Genesis. But um, I do believe that it does relate to uh, the time of the end, um, the, the time when the church will will fall away, become apostate. And that's when God smites the church with his judgment, and judgment begins at the house of God. But thank you for calling and sharing those verses. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good afternoon, Brother Chris. Thank you for today's study, which uh, truly testifies to the fact that only in Christ and his truth do, is there um, true freedom so that all glory goes to him. Um, you may uh, mention that the information concerning the elect being present here at the end of uh, present here on earth in those days after the tribulation, and um, that um, and judge that the elect did not know that they were going to be present because uh, even though it was in plain sight in the Bible that we were going to be here, and isn't that isn't this a confirmation of the scripture of Romans thirteen twelve where it says that. Um, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Oh, uh, first, I think you're referring to First Corinthians 13. Yes, it yes. it does yeah, relate yeah, yeah. to 1 that. Corinthians 13. I'm sorry. It does relate to that. That that uh, God is continuing to open up information. You know, we could wonder, and we did wonder, because the opening of the scriptures identifies with the Great Tribulation, because that's when it began. It was at that point that God did open up his word, and we learn a great many things over the course of the 23-year Great Tribulation period. And and so it, it's really a natural um, thing to wonder, will we continue to learn? And, and yet, um, the end of the Church Age was an enormous doctrine that we learned that God opened up for the Great Tribulation period. But the teaching of God's elect appearing before the judgment seat of Christ and, and, and us actually coming to know that, to, to fully realize and understand that, that is uh, also an enormous doctrine that has never previously been known. And yet, we, as I mentioned earlier, we could go to 2 Corinthians 5, or we could go to Revelation 14, and it's in Revelation 14, in the context of Judgment Day, um, it says in verse 10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And remember Jesus said to James and John, who desired to be seated at his left and right, he said, will you drink of the cup that I drink of? And, and will you be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? They said, yea, Lord. And Jesus confirmed it. And he said, yea, you will drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized. Future tense. With the baptism I am baptized with. And... You know, if at the time Jesus said that, we might think, well, it's referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And But it cannot be because 
the baptism is linked to the drinking of the cup. And, and so it has to do with the wrath of God. And, and here in Revelation 14, the cup of God's wrath is being poured out. Verse 11 of Revelation 14 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And then in verse 12, it, it's a striking statement. It says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Where? Where? It, why does God emphasize here? Like, uh, you know, when you, you go someplace and, and uh, you, you, you're waiting for someone and you, you tell them, I'm here. And they know exactly where you're at. Well, that, that's what God is doing in um, this case in the context of drinking of the cup of wrath. Here is the patience. And patience has to do with and is related to endurance and, and waiting. And, and here is the patience of the saints. It, it's at the time they must drink of the cup of the, the wrath of God, just like Jesus drank of the cup. That's what Christ told the two disciples. Ye will surely drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. And it's, it's really amazing that God um, signaled and put his finger on May 21, 2011, as the beginning of Judgment Day, because it was the equivalent date 7,000 years later on the Hebrew calendar, the 17th day of the second month, that he shut the door of the ark and, and the flood began. The water from heaven began to rain down. So much water that it covered the earth 15 cubits above the highest mountain. And, and so that water of the flood is identified with baptism in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 3... It says in verse 20, which aforetime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. Water was the last statement of verse 20. Then verse 21 says, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. The Lord connects the water of the flood to a figure of baptism. And, and, and so, in a sense, in a way, on May 21, 2011, the water of the Word of God, the wrath of God, came down from heaven above like a deluge, and the earth was covered with His wrath, and it is as though we are in Christ, in the ark, going through the water or the baptism of the wrath of God. Of course, we're protected from, from the harm, the destruction of the flood or of the word of God, because we are in Christ, just as Noah and his family and the animals were in the ark. Yet we're still on the earth. We're still going through a spiritual baptism and the world is being baptized in the sense that they're having their sins purged through the wrath of God. And the world is drinking the cup of God's wrath. And we are drinking along with it in a figure and in a type. Thank you very much for that response, um, Brother Chris. And have a blessed day. Yes, thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go thank to the next person on the phone. And this will have to be our last call this afternoon. Please go ahead with your question. Thank you so much for the study. I appreciate it. 
Um, I just have a quick question about uh, John 14, 2. And I was just trying to make sure I understood it. Um, I guess my question is, you were saying that the word, I think, rooms or mansion meant uh, nest. But when I look in the Blue Letter Bible, and I also look in the Interlinear Bible, uh, it's sort of translating that word as room, dwelling place, abode. I just want to make sure that I understand. Well, yes, I, I, I appreciate you calling, and, and, and so I can clarify. No, no, the Greek word, which is 3438 in John 14.2, um, and, and it's translated as mansions, and it's also translated as abode, and it, and it has the idea of rooms. It, uh, you know, um, <laughs> there there are some people that that um, read that, and they they want mansions, uh, but but uh, you know they're thinking earthly and worldly. But uh, it, it it's just indicating we are within the house of God. We have residence. We are a citizen of the kingdom, is basically what that's saying. The word ness is not translated from this Greek word, but it's back in Hebrew, um, Genesis 6, verse 14 in the Hebrew, with the rooms of the ark. The, the Hebrew word translated as rooms for the ark is a word that means ness. And, and again, that's because a nest is a home, uh, of a bird, but it's a home that is high up, and and, and so it um, pictures heaven, and and that's the idea that entry into the ark is um, akin to being seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But thank you for calling and sharing. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, and uh, especially for your questions and comments and Bible verses that we had an opportunity to read and consider. But we have come to the end of our time. At this point, we're going to return to our online fellowship for more hymn singing and and uh, scripture reading. And all are welcome to stay tuned for that. Also, uh, keep in mind, on Facebook tonight, beginning at 8 p.m., Lord willing, till 9.30 p.m., we'll have our text question and answer um, time uh, on our Facebook group, eBibles Facebook group called Sunday Open Question and Answer. And all are welcome uh, to join that group. But for now, may you have a good afternoon and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thank you for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these questions and answers sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and certain weeknights following the Monday through Friday studies. Check ebiblefellowship.com for the current schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.